Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to uh, part two, FPP Intermediate. Um, John Beck gave us a great presentation on the uh, beginner FPP. And so now we're going to enter into uh, a couple more advanced topics. So uh, I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in chat. And John can address them along the way or uh, save them at the end and he will uh, address them. Then. <coughs> so, uh, John, you've got the floor. All right. Thank you uh, again. John Back uh, lives south of Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, this one should finish and give us uh, probably another at least 10 minutes for a question and answer at the end. So we should be good for that. All right. Uh, FPP Intermediate. Now, this is immediately going to go to a white screen uh, from the previous uh format that I had. I'd never got a chance to change it all to black, but uh, all right. In FPP, uh, you've got to decide when, once you get your FPP up and running, do you want it to run as player or do you want to run it in bridge? Uh, and under player, you even get three choices. You know, player standalone, player master, player remote, so let's talk about the, the player modes first. Uh, if you were to run a show and the only thing you had in your system was a single Raspberry Pi or a single BeagleBone, there's no reason not to use standalone. Um, but if you have two or more, um, you're gonna want, probably gonna want to consider master and remote. And the uh, master option you're going to pick usually uh, the people, the, the master in a system is the one that has your uh, FM transmitter connected to it, or maybe uh, might, maybe it's driving a projector or something like that. But it's the one that uh, is usually the most convenient to get to, uh, but it's going to be the one driving the show. And when I say driving the show, the master <coughs> has to have absolutely every FSEQ file, every MP3 audio file, or every video file that the show is using. Um, and so it, it's, if anything else, it needs the most storage space. The remotes are kind of interesting. Uh, remotes have been around for a long time. Um, but remotes don't need the audio files because they don't play audio. Uh, some people do use them for video, but most don't. But uh, you do need to put an FSEQ file on the remote. And the file names are what's important between master and remote. Because let's say you're, of course, running uh, Wizards of Winter or Wizards in Winter. FSEQ file on the master, the master will send out to remotes data and on all the remotes, it will look for a file name that is exactly the same. And if it finds the exact same file name, it will play it. If it's not an exact match, it doesn't play it. So uh, that's kind of the way the master and remotes uh, work. You don't have to uh, have a very high connection or a you know, fast connection between master and remote. Uh, it works just fine uh, with wireless because all the master does is send out multiple times per second a block of data that says, I am playing this file and I am at this, this time in, in as far as seconds and frames and it sends that data out to all the remotes and all the remotes will go and stay so that they stay in sync. Um, what's nice about it is, uh, well, in master remote mode, uh, and I'll show you a little later, uh, it's all controlled in the multi-sync mode. And that's an important term because masters synchronize the remotes. Uh, so whether you have one remote or whether you have 12 remotes or whether you have 25 remotes, uh, they will stay synchronized with the master. 
Now, bridge mode, as it says in the last paragraph there, is strictly puts the FPP in a receive mode. And in that point, it's not any different uh, in most ways from a Falcon 16 controller or a sand, or sand devices controller or, uh, you know, you pick, pick your whatever controller you use, but what we used to always call dumb controllers, but uh, Dave Pitts would probably be mad at me if I referred to his F-16s as a dumb controller because it's not particularly dumb. But anyway, uh, the bridge mode is just works as a controller. It has no files on it whatsoever. Uh, all it does is receive and plays on pixels that you connect to it. Uh, I guess, yeah, Ad, Advitech um, is one of those. And it will accept E131 or DDP protocols. Uh, does not yet accept ArtNet. I don't know if it, uh, if it will. And, so uh, kind of talked about standalone mode. Uh, as it says, it's probably not used that much because most people uh, are running more than one FPP. So if you're running two, uh, chances are you're not using standalone mode much. But, uh, and then master mode, I don't want to beat that one to death again. Uh, but as it says here, other FPPs, you could control over a hundred remotes and the system would handle it. Um, I think the most I've ever done was 11 remotes uh, and that was more for testing, uh, but my show actually had seven uh, and they all stayed synchronized. So just one, the master has the clock. Uh, in fact, the master is the only one that cares about the time. So remotes do nothing but listen, uh, whether you're connected via wireless or whether you're connected via Cat5. Um, all they do is listen for that sync pulse that's, that's sent out. And uh, even if they, if they miss a sync pulse or two, uh, then as soon as they pick up a proper sync pulse, they just jump right back into sync. And uh, unless they skip a lot of them, you'll never notice that it skipped. Uh, bridge mode again, uh, just a dumb, dumb controller. Uh, <clears throat> I will mention uh, this last year, uh, kind of based on something Dan Culp had tossed out uh, about uh, DDP mode. I ran my entire Christmas show with uh, six FPPs running in bridge mode and connected to uh, the system via Cat5. I went totally wire, uh, wireless free this year. Um, and it really worked pretty well. Uh, bridge mode is, is pretty slick uh, in some ways, but it was really just like I'd had uh, a dozen controllers out in the yard, dumb controllers out in the yard. So, yeah, but it, it works pretty well. If you have more questions about bridge mode, you can ask at the end. So you take your pick as far as player mode, uh, but you got to have sequencing files uh, on the FPP. So if it's, if it's standalone or master uh, or remote, you just, you've got to have those FSEQ files on there to, to play. Only the master cares about audio though. So in the file manager, um, you've got a sequence folder, audio folder, video folder. Uh, if you're running, if you do effects, I don't think I talk much about effects or scripts during this, but uh, uh, they all kind of just go in their, in their spot. So setting up a network, this can get kind of uh, tricky. In fact, I would say, uh, more people have trouble with networking of their FPPs than any other single problem. Um, sometimes it's just because they don't really understand networking, but you do not have to be a networking wizard to make this stuff work. Uh, 
as it shows here, it's, I know the lettering's kind of small, but uh, you have the choices of ETH0, which is your CAT5 connection, or you have WLAN0, which would be your wireless connection. And depending on which one you have highlighted in blue, um, you can change between static and DHCP. Now, a lot of people like they'll they'll do use one or the other and have good reasons for it for static versus DHCP. But yeah, a static address. If you tell your uh, FPP to use a static address, that means it's not going to change. Uh, at least it's not going to change uh, readily. Uh, I have seen them change because all of a sudden something else on your network, uh, like maybe your printer or your wife's computer, uh, stole that address. But uh, every now and then it'll it'll mess up on you. DHCP, on the other hand, um, your router will just give whatever address is available. Uh, usually it'll give the same one over and over and over again, but sometimes they'll switch. Um, the other day I had a power outage and when my router came back up and everything else came back up, two out of four uh, FPPs had changed DHCP addresses on me. Uh, so it just made that difference. Uh, IP address. NetMask and Gateway. Um, so for static, for well, DHCP, you don't put anything in there. It just fills it in for you. But for static, uh, you'd put in your IP address, a NetMask of 255.255.255.0. And then a Gateway is almost always the IP address of your system router. Uh, for wireless, uh, if you're hooking up to your home uh, router, wireless router, you'll put in your uh, SSID there. Um, used to have a problem with people who would use hidden IDs, hidden SSIDs, and it didn't like it. But now if you know that your router does use hidden SSIDs, uh, check that little box right there, um, and it should, should handle it. Otherwise, it just has trouble finding it. The uh, password talks about PSK, but that's your password there. Um, <clears throat> at no point does it ever encrypt your password. If you type in your password there, it's just going to be in plain text. So it's not a super secure system uh, for that reason, but uh, it doesn't asterisk it out or anything. So. Um, just try not to make your password too ridiculously hard um, or with too many funky characters in it. Um, people have had trouble with it because their password was basically too hard. Uh, in the previous uh, intro class, I talked about the next step down here for host and DSN, DNS settings. It always comes up as FPP initially. <coughs> Change that as soon as you can to something meaningful. Uh, no two devices on your system should have the same host name. Uh, it'll tolerate it, but it's not a good thing because then you things get confused. And now you can put a description in there. Um, and that's useful uh, when we will go in here in a little bit and look at the uh, multi-sync page and you'll see where the description can come up. DNS servers, uh, very common fix here. Uh, a lot of people have trouble with DNS. You know, why won't it find my updates? Why won't it do this? Why won't it do that? And uh, the main reason is for what, you know, the DNS server that your router is using just doesn't work right. But if you will put in, for DNS server, and I didn't write it in. Maybe it's on the next screen. But uh, if you used 8.8.8.8 .8 in one of them, and 1.1.1.1, .1 .1 .1, 
Is that enough ones? It should be four ones. Those are uh, specific DNS uh, servers run by Google, and they are by far the most reliable DNS servers I've ever run across. And it just seems to solve a world of problems. So regardless of what your router thinks, your DNS server should be. Uh, I highly recommend the eights, the eights and the ones uh, for your DNS servers. <clears throat> Log folders. Uh, most of the time, if everything is working right, you do not have to have in FPP settings, you do not need anything checked for logging. <clears throat> Uh, if you are logging things, some things always get logged, but uh, if you uncheck them all, uh, it doesn't doesn't log a lot of things. So um, bring that up here. You should be able to see that now. Like, for instance, uh, I have none of them checked on my running FPP here, so it's not saving a lot of data, and that just makes everything run faster. The reason you would check them is if you're having trouble, uh, you can, at that point, it'll keep track of the problems and save, hopefully, some information that the programmers can go in. Uh, as it uh, says down here, if you attempted to send a file, it doesn't show up. No, it's different. Yeah, uh, post a log file on the Falcon Christmas forum. Uh, you just post the problem, describing it uh, in detail. That's probably the most common second question after somebody writes a problem in is, we need more information. So you cannot give too much information. Um, just saying it's locked <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really help much. Oh, let's talk about playlists. Um, in the new version, starting with 2.5, version 2.5, version 2.6, and now version 2.7, there were a lot of changes made to playlists. Now, you can see here, um, and these are still some of the ones I had from Christmas, but let me scroll down a ways. Well, actually, let me just start a new one. We'll just call it X Essentials. Brand new playlist, and it's no, you'll see no entries in the playlist. But what you have now is a whole lot of new, new type items uh, for your playlist details. You can pick just your media, which would be your FSEQ file or your MP3 files, your FSEQ files for your sequence. You can do branching out to other playlists. Uh, you can add in channel remaps, uh, do dynamic changes. Uh, one of the really slick things they added here recently is uh, volume. You can actually come in and change the volume between songs. <clears throat> Every now you may have run into a song that was a little too soft or a little too loud. You can actually come in before and after that song and change the volume and uh, make a percent adjustment between. Uh, so drop the volume before the song plays and then bump it back up when it's finished, that sort of thing. But just a whole lot of new, new entries uh, in here. And uh, most of these are covered in the, the help documents. And the help documents, if you're not familiar, are up here under, under F1. Well, <laughs> they've moved it. They didn't put it there. You might have to look on the Falcon Falcon board. So to add, pick a media file. Uh, so I've got one picked. And let's see if I can find wish list right there. I can add that. Come in now and then you can add uh, a pause and say, you know, I want it to pause uh, 10 seconds give people the chance to move, that sort of thing. But uh, it's all, all relatively simple. But 
the thing that people always forget is if you make a change in here, come back and save it. Because if you don't save it and you leave the screen and come back, you've, you've lost it. So just, and it will not warn you that you're about to change. Uh, leave, leave that screen without uh, saving. So there's no limit to the number of playlists you can have. There's no real limit to the number of songs you can have in your playlist. <clears throat> oh, the same same thing that I just demoed there. The, all these are just your new your new options, uh, and some descriptions branching uh, as far as true false logic to start. Stop your files, uh, remapping files. Let me mention briefly uh, what channel remap may be good for. Uh, this was particularly useful back when I did a lot of AC lighting. Um, I'd have a, a triac on an AC controller go out. So like channel 37 all of a sudden was dead, but I had a open channel 40. So I could go under channel remap and tell it everything that was on 37 now to go to 40. And uh, you, boom, all of a sudden I didn't have to fix the controller or anything. I just had to move the plug. But to channel remaps and uh, you can do it within just a playlist now, or there's still always been this, the global option that would change it for everything. But, but now you can actually do it within the playlist. So John, there's a question on randomize on that prior screen. There was a new selection called randomize. Yes. Is that is. the, uh, let me go back to that one. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. Randomize. Uh, the only time I've ever used that was I had I had a playlist with uh, ten songs in it, and my wife said, "You know, we we need to change the order up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday." And what what I did was I just hit randomize and shifted it and just resaved it as Tuesday. And then I'd randomize it and save it as Wednesday. And it just saved me. Uh, but all it'll do is it'll just shuffle, shuffle the order of your files. Um, let me pick one and I just won't save it. So let's go to this one. So I've got, I got 20 files here. Let's hit randomize. And you see, it just it just shifted them. You just keep keep hitting it, and each time you you do it, it's just uh, now whether it's truly random, I don't know. That's up to the, between the programmers and you, but uh, um, that's all it's good for. And it seems to randomize the pauses too, so that might oh, not yeah. be a oh, great yeah. feature, or at least recognize that it's doing that. Yep. And those I put those pauses in on mine just to to give people time to move their cars. But uh, uh, and a lot of people just put blank. They put blank space at the end of their MP3 files for the same purpose, in which that case uh, you wouldn't have to put the pauses in. But uh, yeah, I have a few songs that once it finishes, you've got about two seconds and the next one starts so i just would put the pause in between them so does that answer your question on randomize pretty yep pretty useful now um i don't use any home automation devices uh i don't have uh house lights that come on and off or uh, uh but there's a whole lot of whole new automation stuff with this MQTT thing. Uh, while this isn't maybe a good uh, Christmas light show item, but if you were using FPP to run your home automation, you could very easily turn your coffee machine on and off, your TV on and off, your living room lights on and off uh, using these new MQTT functions. But it's all just built in, and and you'd control your house as a playlist, just like you'd be controlling your Christmas show. 
So pausing playlist, uh, playlist, start another playlist within a playlist. And then when it finishes that, it comes back to the original, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and I already did that. I added an FSEQ, an audio file. Um, as it says, most times you do add both um, sequence and media. Uh, they do not, the names do not have to match. Uh, if they do match, then having this auto select feature selected, it'll usually, if you pick one, it'll pick the other one automatically. Mine never seemed to match, so uh, having that check doesn't really help me much. Down at the bottom, um, let me go back, bring this over here again. Uh, the dragging and dropping, like uh, you'd mentioned that the pause, uh, it moved those. So that would need to be moved up. It's literally just click and drag to, uh, to move it back in, get those uh, reorganized. So you can see here, I even have a sequence with no sound file. It's just playing an FSEQ file. Uh, so just drag them to get them in the order. Um, after you do your randomize, you can kind of go in and cl clean it up. Um, oh, and so, yeah, I just covered that. Drag the entry to reposition. And once again, and I, I'll just mention it one more time, uh, save that playlist. All those changes you just made, if you switch to another screen, they are gone. They did not get stored uh, to the flash drive or to your micro SD card, and you'll be wishing you did. So FPP scheduler, that's the next step. Uh, I'll show you, I've got those choices, but let me bring actual, the actual screen in here. The scheduler is your third item down. Uh, so once you have a playlist, it's up to you now to schedule that playlist. And, and I'll bring this up simply because I wanted to show off, uh, I mentioned it in the earlier class, uh, sunrise and sunset. Uh, I called a playlist sunrise, sunset. So every day it starts at sunset and turns itself off at sunrise. And I've actually checked it, and based on my longitude and latitude, uh, it knows what time it is. Now, where do you set that? You go down to uh, configuration time, and there's my 32.42. <clears throat> So it even tells you where to go get the data uh, from Google Maps or from there. Put it in and it's accurate out to those places. And the interesting thing is it does not need an internet connection. Once you set those, uh, it does not need an internet connection anymore to determine that time. Um, it just knows as long as you're, uh, you've got a clock on there. Um, it just knows. So set your time zone to be correct, set your location, and then you can go in and you can use the scheduler to turn your landscaping lights on and off. Or if you only want to run your show <clears throat> from sunrise to sunset or uh, vice versa, that doesn't make much sense for Christmas, but uh, it does work. Uh, all these other options, you got just a huge choice of uh, what days you want. And then even threw in this day mask at the end, which now lets you, if you, if none of those other choices were good, now you can pick your actual days and, uh, and worry about it that way. So there's just, well, I don't know that there can be too many choices, but there are a lot. So, pick those and again make sure you save because if you don't save um, 
So the way I set it, it's going to do my sunrise sunset on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday from sunset <coughs> to sunrise. Excuse me. Um, one thing they did fix um, a while back now, but still was has always been a problem is if you wanted to do something that went over midnight, um, it would fail. It would always just kind of quit at midnight and it wouldn't roll over. But now it is smart enough that if you do pick, say from this is five, 5 p.m. Uh, to, uh, to 10 p.m., you can actually set it to like one o'clock, uh, 1 a.m., and it is smart enough now, it will actually roll over midnight and stop at one in the morning. So that's a, that's a new fix. So they just put in some logic to check that. And again, make sure you save. Just way too many choices. Uh, now, I'll be honest with you. The reason that they put all these choices in here is because X Lights uh, X Scheduler got upgraded and picked up a whole lot of these options. So the FPP programmers decided not to be left behind. And so they came in and made all these changes just so that uh, uh, they could keep up. And uh, don't tell them I said that. Uh, plugins and scripts. A uh, whole lot of plugins and scripts. And now I've listed them, but let's take an actual look and, uh, and see where those are located. So you got a plugin manager and you got a script browser. So let's take a look at the script browser first. Um, gotta have an internet connection. No internet connection, you won't see uh, all of these scripts, but uh, you just scroll down through and there are, uh, as I showed in that list, uh, like 30, 30 something of them doing various things, uh, remote controls, uh, starting and stopping effects, pixel overlays, clocks, etc. So you just install it, click install. Uh, if you wanted to view the file to see what it looks like, you can. And if you can read that, then you can probably could probably write your own scripts. Um, but sometimes you do have to come in and edit it uh, to get the playlist names right. If you're going to use it, you'll actually have to edit. So let's take a look at that. Um, I'm going to go ahead <clears throat> and install. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to install this one right here called Check If Playing. And you don't see much happened, but what it did was it put that script in the file manager under scripts, and here's Check If Playing. And if you're going to use that now, you have to now come in and say edit. And at this point, you're going to have to scroll down through and find the playlist names um, or script names. Yeah, it says put your script name here. Uh, just edit it, save it. And uh, so it's, they're just very generic. And you just have to come in and, and fill in your text. Just read down through it. And it even tells you where to edit it. You can see it's got the comments. But that's about all, you know, scripts for me, <clears throat> since I don't actually write uh, scripts, uh, they either work or they don't. <laughs> and I have to ask somebody to help me uh, figure out why a script doesn't work. So plugins are a little bit different. And there's several plugins, some of them kind of useful. Um, you got your big buttons, uh, which gives you an option of uh, controlling. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's ever, if you have your master as a wireless FPP, you can actually go stand out on the street um, 
and control your show from from your phone or from a laptop or from a, an iPad. Um, but if you use big buttons, you can actually, I'm going to install it. It's not installed. Now it's, and now it's installed. That didn't take very long. Uh, so there's your list. And big buttons now is down here at the bottom under plugins. And it says, I don't have any scripts. <laughs> and, and it's true. It, what what uh, big buttons does is run scripts. And I don't have any scripts installed. But uh, let's pick a different one. Uh, big green button. All right, big green button is installed. There's a big green button. And now, pick a script. Whatever script you have defined, when you click start, uh, and it may be the start of your show, you just click start and it will run that script and, uh, and uh, the show starts. So there's first night, oh, there's my existential. So these are actual playlist names. So it's actually gonna start a playlist uh, based on your plugin. So, yep, plugin managers. The ones that I use um, are pretty useful. Uh, if you use P P10 panels or any kind of large matrix, you're going to want to install matrix tools. And for this one, um, I'm actually going to switch to a different FPP. <coughs> to do that, I've got one, I've got a matrix installed on a, a beagle bone. And let's take a look here. Under script repository, you'll see, no, nope, wrong. I wanted plugins, plugin manager. You can see I've got, uh, well, I had matrix tools installed. Oh, it's already installed. Matrix tools. Um, this lets me actually um, I've got a 64 by 32 matrix. I can enable it and come over here and pick red. And as I'm drawing over here, and you can't see it because I don't have a camera, the matrix that's sitting over here to my left, just I just got a red line going down the side and a blue line or a green line. It actually lets you live draw on your matrix. It will let you put text across your matrix. And we'll say go. And you should be able to see that. You've got X essentials scrolling across and I can see it on my matrix to my left. So. <coughs> What's nice about that is if your Christmas show is running, you can come in here and enable that and uh, best to set it up as transparent. If you've set it up as transparent, it will actually display that scrolling text across your show, whatever you had running on that matrix. It will actually display it across it uh, non-destructively. So it's kind of a slick feature. I used it a couple of years back. Uh, I would ask kids what their birthday was. And uh, if it was their birthday, I'd put their name across while they were watching the show. Parents thought that was pretty slick. Let's see what else. So plugins and scripts. These are all the plugins. Um, don't use very many of them, but uh, sometimes you may want to do shutdown and remote. It's just a matter of reading through them, and the the titles are pretty pretty self descriptive, self explanatory. Input and output. Um, 
interesting thing about the new version of FPP is under input and output, you have channel inputs, which, it, which is its own screen, and you have channel outputs, which is its own screen. Um, if you don't have anything attached, uh, you just configure either beagle bone strings, like I say, this is a beagle bone, um, or LED panels. In my case, the panel that I have attached is a set of two by two panels. Um, so you'd set up your outputs. Uh, inputs, this is really only if you're using your bridge mode, which we talked about right at the very beginning. If you're running master or remote, uh, you won't put anything here. <clears throat> Even if you did, it would ignore it. But let's go back to channel outputs, because there's a lot of choices there, particularly in the other category. Um, You choose add and you can have more than one output. Uh, so you click add and now we've got to pick a type. So depending on what you have here attached to your FPP, you may be out trying to output DMX Pro, DMX Open, uh, just serial data, straight out to the GPIO pins. Uh, some people still like to do that. Uh, put out Lidorama protocol, pixel nets, Renards, uh, virtual matrix, which uh, lets you actually output make, uh, data. It will, uh, I get the two virtual matrix and virtual display mixed up, but the virtual matrix, you have to come in and tell it uh, how many, what your channel count is and uh, how wide and you don't even have to own a matrix like this you can just sort of define one uh, and your color and tell it what it's attached to and uh, and you can actually create a matrix even though maybe it doesn't technically exist um, virtual display slightly different um, but you can see from these sizes, that's really more for outputting to a video screen. So what some people will do is they'll output a virtual display of their entire show onto a computer monitor or onto a TV uh, using this option. I've never really used it. I've heard it works well, but I, I can't say that I've ever tried it. Other options. Uh, this last one is kind of slick. Um, if you need to do turn on and off uh, things with motors, uh, AC stuff, uh, I use it for blow-ups uh, at, at Halloween time. Uh, I've got inflatables, and I've got a little relay board that has four ports on it. And uh, you just tell it start channel and your your count over here mine's a four port so i actually have four outputs i tell it whether it's on tty zero zero and uh, how many channel counts and it just those relays go click 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 and everything goes on and off uh, when you need it to and you just control it from a playlist that's about it for channel outputs Um, EDP, uh, in bridge mode, if you wanted to run in bridge mode, uh, this distributed display protocol, uh, like it says there, is a much more efficient than E131. Uh, as I even provided the numbers, 72% E131, ArtNet's 85% efficient, but DDP, uh, is almost pure data and very little overhead. So it's sending a whole lot more data uh, at one time, larger amounts of data. And, uh, and that's how I ran my show last year, uh, was using mostly DDP out to uh, 
to a lot of my FPPs and it worked like a champ. Uh, it does not work well over wireless because it's just too much data for wireless, but it works great over Cat5. Okay, channel outputs. Um, as it says here, used to channel inputs and output shared a page, but uh, now they're on their very own page. Uh, but if you wanted to use outputs, let me bring this screen back over again. Channel outputs, and this is the page we're talking about here. Let's say you wanted to do 10 universes, we'll set it, and uh, now you just you fill in your your channels, um, your start channels, your universe counts, universe size, whether it's multicast. Uh, and this is where you could pick Artnet. You could also pick DDPs. My dogs are going crazy. I think they want to eat dinner or something. But uh, <clears throat> This is where you're actually going to be outputting either through your ethernet port, uh, but occasionally you, somebody may be actually outputting through their uh, wireless port. But whatever this data is, is going out through that port um, to control something like a Falcon 16 or, uh, or even another DDP, uh, or not DD, another FPP. Uh, but some other controller, but this uh, this is just output to a controller. This is output to pixel strings, and this is output to P10, P5, P6 panels, and then we we beat the that one kind of to death uh, for others. The <clears throat> I, I don't know why I put the Falcon Pi dongle in. I don't think there's very many people other than Jim uh Neeland, are you still using your, your Pi dongle? I've never never owned one. Never owned one? I thought you used to. No, I used a Pixel Net dongle. Ah, uh, okay. Well, uh, the Falcon Pi dongle was real, real useful about five, six years ago, but not too many people still use it. Does, does anybody out there still use one? I sold my last one. Um, so I'm not going to spend any real time on, <laughs> on the FPD dongle. So <sighs> Raspberry Pi, let me go back now to my Raspberry Pi. Go to multi-sync, back to my Raspberry Pi. Channel outputs to pixel strings. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, when you put a Pi cap on it or whether you want to wire directly to the GPIO pins, your choice, um, first thing you're going to do is add your outputs. And it gives you two options. Uh, but your only real protocol protocol choice is to do the WS twenty eight elevens or twenty eight twelves. You set up your channel counts. You uh, set up color orders. All all that, just like you would on any other controller. But this is strictly outputting to pixels. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's five volt or twelve volt. Uh, because the Pi doesn't power them. The uh, Pi cap does, or you can power them independently. Ultimately though, you've got to make sure that the output is enabled. You gotta have valid numbers in here. And when you save it, it's going to save it and it's gonna reboot. And when it reboots, because you've told it to use pixel strings, it's gonna kill your sound uh, because the Pi cap cannot control pixel strings and sound onboard sound. You'll have to use the a, a sound blaster or some sort of USB uh, sound because it just won't use the onboard sound anymore. Let's see. 
I'm getting close to finished here. Uh, LED panels is for the P5, P10 panels. Uh, as I said in that class, this was its very own class, so I didn't really get too much into it. Uh, but uh, P10 panels uh, using pixel panels is kind of its own specialty thing. Um, oh, and I already covered I already covered all of this. Uh, all of your choices for uh, for your final outputs. <clears throat> I mentioned here that it will only do WS twenty eight elevens. Every now and then, somebody wants to do WS twenty eight o ones, which is a four wire protocol. And if you want to do that, you literally can, but you have to come in here and do it this way, and you have to wire it manually uh, rather than use a pi cap. Uh, and it will do a four wire output, um, but you gotta you gotta do a little work to make that make that happen. Uh, beagle bone differences. Uh, mostly everything I've shown you was uh, on the pi, but. Uh, the biggest difference between the pi and the beagle bone is the PRU, the programmable real-time units on the beagle bone does let it control more things. In the case of, uh, for example, P10 panels, a Raspberry Pi can control uh, three output strings of like 12 panels max per string. So say a total of 36. Whereas a beagle bone, because of those PRU units, can control eight strings. And I believe Dan has actually gone out to like 16 panels on eight strings. I don't recommend it. Uh, the refresh rate gets pretty slow. But uh, it can handle just a tremendous amount of data because of those PRUs. Um, so you just kind of have to take your pick. The beagle bone is more expensive than the Pi, but not a lot. Uh, also, the current BeagleBone uh, has a slower Ethernet port, and it only has one USB. Lots of different choices uh, for capes on the BeagleBone. And uh, Ed, I know I'm real close to time here, but... Uh, Not a problem. Just keep going. I'll keep rolling. I'm almost done. Uh, <clears throat> this is currently the list of all of the BeagleBone capes. Uh, that have been made or currently for sale. Some of them you couldn't find now if you wanted unless you bought them used. Uh, but uh, just many of them, many of them give you just like 48 outputs, uh, which is more than you, you'll get off of just about anything else. And that's because of those PRU units. Pocket Beagle uh, is much smaller. Uh, not quite as capable, a little less expensive too, uh, but it's still, it has PRUs and it can do quite a bit. Uh, so as it is the pocket scroller, I think costs, uh, where does it say? I don't know, they're cheap, like 15 bucks or something like that. Um, well, I want to thank you, John, for uh, a excellent presentation, double feature, first time we've done this. Uh, I learned quite a lot about the advanced features uh, of FBP and a lot of the uh, updates. So I want to thank you and appreciate it. I want to remind everybody that um, if you go to falconchristmas.com, on the right-hand side of the page is a donate button. So please remember the developers of FPP, Captain Murdoch, uh, Dan Culp, uh, and those folks over there. So please remember to do that. The X Lights Project exists because of people like you. Help continue the project by making a donation today at xlights.org donate.